Are there really no barbers left in this town? Really, if you're a barber, give me a call. I need you. Welcome back to Hootie Style Channel. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the hardware I'm using for Project Elizabeth. First things first though, the reason it is called Project Elizabeth is quite simple really. When this project started to become serious, my ambition was to have a female assistant called Elizabeth. And I actually succeeded with my goal, but realized that using Elizabeth as a hot word to activate the assistant was impractical. It would very often falsely trigger and it just didn't make it past the hoodie style quality control. -uh. Now that we have that covered, let's go on with today's subject. Since I didn't give you that many pointers about the frame in the Hardware 101 episode, let me show you what we got going on here. As you could see in the first episode and the build montage, the frame of Project Elizabeth is made of wood. For the visible parts, I've used oiled oak wood. These pillars go all the way from the floor to the ceiling and the whole frame measures about 2.4 meters times 75 centimeters and is about five and a half centimeters thick. For the parts that aren't visible, I've used whatever wood I had lying around. The oak wood is accented with aluminium, which gives a very clean and sophisticated look, in my opinion. And it was very important for me to get an impression of professional manufacturing here. And I have to say, I'm very satisfied with the results. The side profiles and the top brace actually only have a supportive role. The top brace stops the glass from falling forward and the side profiles make sure the glass won't bulge out, as this is a relatively tall structure. The heavy lifting, though, is done by the lower brace, which is carrying all the weight of the mirror. This brace is bolted to a wooden crossbar uh, behind the glass, and the whole structure is held in place by one single screw to the wall. The undone part here will be covered by oak panels so that the heat can still dissipate. One of the panels will also be mounting point for the microphone and the speakers. Okay, enough about the frame. Let's talk about the glass. This is a large sheet of Pilkington Mirror View. I think this is amongst the best glass you can get for this application. Mirror View has a 65% reflection and 35% transparency rating. Pilkington, the manufacturer of the glass, also has a mirror view 5050, which you probably can guess has a 50% reflection, 50% transparency rating. But I don't recommend getting that unless your mirror is destined to always stand in a very bright area like a showroom or similar or outdoors. In a darker environment, the structures behind the glass will show. So you don't want that. Anywho, I purchased a six millimeter thick sheet because of the tall uh, nature of this design, but most builds can get away with thinner glass. Next, we have the display. Behind this glass is an LG B7 55 inch OLED TV. I needed a display with perfect blacks, but also a display that was thin enough to fit within the five and a half centimeters of the frame, which isn't much space given that the glass itself takes up six millimeters of that space leaving me with 4.9 centimeters to work with. <laughs> the narrow space also creates another issue. Larger displays tend to get hot in closed up areas. And so I'm using two tiny 40 millimeter Noctua fans to just keep the air moving behind the display. These little things are amazing for their size and more than sufficient to keep the otherwise passively cooled display from overheating. There is, however, a big elephant in the room here. A big downside to using an OLED for this type of application. And that is the risk of burn-in. Since the mirror displays a lot of static text, it becomes a poison for the OLED. Now, LG has some protection algorithms to prevent burn-in, and they are horribly intrusive in every sense. There are different things triggering these algorithms, but they all result in the screen getting dimmed to protect the diodes. 
Some of these can be turned off with a special service remote and others cannot. The algorithms can, for example, result in lowered brightness within a few minutes of an image staying static, which sounds good, but they aren't smart enough to know what's going on on the screen. So even if you display a totally black picture, which essentially means that all pictures are off on an OLED, the TV still sees this as a static image and lowers the brightness until something major happens on screen. So having a small ball bouncing around on the screen, for example, is not enough to get out of this dimmed protection. As you might understand, I'm not a big fan of these algorithms, but there are good second line protection in case something stops working on the software side of my setup. My solution to all this is to wipe the screen when no one is in front of the mirror, but as I mentioned, the problem is that something needs to be happening on the screen for the TV not to lower the brightness. So I did the easiest thing I could do and turned on the screensaver. First I tried small objects moving around, but the algorithms proved to be very aggressive and still lowered the brightness. And so it kept the screen dim, even when it changed back to, you know, the mirror view. So I had to have a full-on activity with the screensaver. I just made sure that whatever I chose never touched the edge of the display, as to not ruin the illusion, just in case someone would catch a glimpse. So how do we break the screensaver when someone gets in front of the mirror? Well, the solution to that is also kind of easy. I used a PIR sensor, or as known to most, a motion sensor. This is a very easy to use circuit. Uh, you give it a low voltage feed and it will output a small signal whenever someone passes by. I have connected this to an Arduino Leonardo and you have probably heard of Arduino boards. Uh, in short, they are small controller boards that you can use to control lights, motors, actuators, servos, you name it. And uh, programming them is fairly easy if you have some type of programming background or if, if you even know JavaScript, you could probably program it pretty easily. The most common Arduino is called Uno. And here's a tip if you like projects like this, go and buy yourself an Arduino Uno and search for some how-to videos. It's super fun and you learn very fast. Now I'm using an Arduino Leonardo here and one big difference versus the Arduino Uno is that this one can act as a human interface device over USB. With other words, it can uh, behave as a mouse or keyboard controller. So what I'm doing here is that every time someone walks in front of the mirror, the signal is sent from the motion sensor to the Arduino, which then turns a keystroke to the computer running the mirror. And this breaks the screensaver. And to avoid getting any letters typed in the background, I've chosen the keystroke to be the shift key. Okay, remember in the Hardware 101 episode, I said that the Raspberry Pi 4 can't do 4K in a smooth way? Well, there is something you probably already suspected. I'm not running this on a Raspberry Pi 4. When this project started, I had a Raspberry Pi 1 given to me by a very good friend of mine who got me into this mess. But through the different stages of testing, I moved up to Raspberry Pi 3. And when I realized I wanted 4K, I migrated the whole project to Raspberry Pi 4, which is the only Raspberry Pi that can handle 4K at the moment. Unfortunately, it couldn't keep 60 frames per second when it came to animations. And even with overclocking and all tricks in the book, it was still struggling and crashed from time to time because of the high workload. So I decided to go badass. This is an Intel NUC. It's a small form factor PC, full-fledged 64-bit Intel PC. This particular model is an 8th gen i3 with an Iris Plus 655 integrated GPU. It's one of the weaker NUC models, but compared to a Raspberry Pi 4, this is a super computer. These NUCs come without RAM and SSD. So I added 120 gigabytes of SSD and eight gigabytes of RAM. It can now play back a 4K movie while delivering a smooth browsing experience. So to say the least, 
it is more than capable to take care of the task at hand and delivers 60 frames per second animations and smooth transitions without any hiccups. It does have a small annoying fan that can get loud with time as dust gets in there and it's not very practical to blow out and clean so I do have a remedy for that in another episode. Also it's missing HDMI CEC controls which the Raspberry Pi has which makes it possible to turn the display on and off via software. So it's missing this very, very important function here, but I have a remedy for that as well. So Nuke upgrades coming in an upcoming episode. Finally, this is the microphone I'm using. This is a Seed Studios re-speaker mic array version 2. It's one of the coolest little developer mics out there. Trust me. It has a four microphone array with directional recognition and onboard chip to cut out the noise. With this, I can collect the sound from four microphones, remove the background noise, and send a pure signal to the Nook. This makes it possible to, for example, talk to the mirror even if there is music running in the background. <sighs> that was a lot of nerdy info. If you like more in-depth details on something, just go ahead and ask me in the comment section. If you think I should make an easier to follow super noob version of, I don't know, the hardware stuff, let me also know that in the comment section. And as always, like and subscribe. In the next episode, hopefully, I've had my hair cut. And we will talk about the software side of things. This is Hootie, Hootie Style Channel, and I'll be seeing you in the next episode. Hootie Style Channel